had to interleave between the panels uh, short, short sections of one-to-one -one interviews. We thought there is a value to bring uh, some interesting people to stage and have a little bit of in-depth discussion uh, with them. You recall last year we had one-to-one -one conversations with uh, Kofi Annan and uh, with uh, Paul Polman, the chief executive of Unilever, uh, who is important, the business role and what's going on, etc. And the third one was was uh, Bono, uh, again about activism, and uh, so we said we straddled uh, three strands there. Uh, today, my first conversation should have been with Amina Mohammed, our sister from United Nations, well, from Nigeria, actually, not from United Nations, but she's now the Deputy Secretary General of United Nations. And she called me on Tuesday night uh, rather uh, distraught because she was leading the process of reform of the United Nations. I gather, I gather you are all aware of the problem of the reform of the United Nations and uh, it's something people trying to do for the last 10 years or so. And she, she was hoping to close this by Friday, but unfortunately some powers that be threw banners at the last, at the last days and the process is in jeopardy now. And I told her, look, Amina, you, that's more important than coming having a chat with me. You, 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 you please stay and uh, uh, do so. Apologies from her. She offered to do a video, but I said that doesn't work because we need to have life and people can ask questions if needed or whatever. So we said next year we'll bring you and tell us about your reforms. I hope you manage to sort it out by then. Uh, but fortunately, uh, somebody also very interesting stepped in in the last minute to do this conversation with me. And uh, I'm very proud to introduce the former Ethiopian Prime Minister, Haile, Ma Haile Mariam Desiden, please. Can you join me? Yeah, while they are uh, miking uh, the Prime Minister, uh, I just want to say something. Uh, Haile Mariam was Prime Minister for, for six years, yes. And he almost stunned everybody. He definitely stunned me by resigning and leaving. Uh, this something doesn't happen in Ethiopia. Doesn't happen anywhere in Africa anyway. And, <laughs> and uh, do I need this one now? I can, is it okay like this? Can you hear me? Okay, excellent. Switch this off. Uh, I said this is something strange. And uh, in 3000 history of Ethiopia, Ethiopia is one of the greatest African countries with a fantastic history. 100 million people, one of the most important countries in Africa. Nobody, nobody ever left office voluntarily in the history of Ethiopia until this gentleman sitting next to me here throws this bomb at everybody and he decided to leave the office. And I was really stunned. And uh, I asked him, and I think the answer was really equally amazing. And I want you to hear it from his mouth. Prime Minister, why did you throw it? Why did you leave? You had a wonderful life, you know, nice house, big cars, and 
you're ahead of a country of 100 million people. That's, it. That's wonderful. I love that. Um, first of all, uh, my good friend Mo, I, I just want to thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak about uh, the story about my beautiful country, Ethiopia, uh, this uh, time of history in this country. Um, yes, my country is a long-standing uh, civilization, uh, goes to millennia. But uh, if you see the whole history of this country, uh, democracy is a very new thing to this country. It's only 20 years of democratic experience in this country. So you can imagine, out of the 3,000 years and beyond, uh, only a fledgling democracy of 20 years. So uh, this is where it stands. You know, if you see, since uh, my, guard, my party has come to power, uh, the last uh, 25 years, and, and basically uh, the first 10 years was just learning because uh, the country has been in uh, a military regime and the command economy, so you have to restructure and shift the whole thing in the country, and that exercise has taken 10 years. And uh, by doing so, I think the last only 15 years that every African understand that this country has robust uh, fast economic growth in the continent. Even uh, last week in the spring meeting of uh, IMF, I came to understand the report shows that Ethiopia is the fastest growing economy, again in Africa with 8.5 uh, percentage growth annually. Um, yeah, I think this has been an, uh, an inspiration for uh, many African countries that it's possible to grow very fast. Uh, but this growth has to be shared, equitable, and sustained. And uh, I think if you see also uh, the growth uh, has been shared with a Gini coefficient of 0 0.3, uh, which is remarkable again. But there is one issue. I like that the Prime Minister is quoting numbers. Yeah. I love figures, and it is good our Af African leaders start to use numbers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's because I am I am engineer by profession, so right. uh, I like also numbers. Um, but the whole thing is, you know, this is a very huge country, multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-religious, and you need to to address this issue very carefully, and uh, you have to accommodate diversity and inclusive governance system is a necessity for this country. Um, besides, we, in the policy of uh, my government earlier, uh, we have, we say democracy is an existential issue for us. It's not just choosing amongst uh, the best governance systems. It is an existential issue because we are um, situated in a, in a volatile horn of Africa region where peace and tranquility is one of the big questions. And uh, there are failed states uh, surrounding us in many ways. Yeah. So peace and tranquility is very important, and we have to uh, include the se all sections of the society into uh, the governance system. What happened is, you know, maybe it, it could be a good lesson and should be researched, that when a country moves out of abject poverty, and when there is an awakening of uh, the society, we call uh, in Ethiopia, I know it's 100 million population uh, compared with many African countries, you can imagine. When this giant, uh, you know, uh, rises up from sleeping, yeah. then what happens has to be properly understood. And there needs to be a greater reform, a deeper reform, to accommodate uh, the quest of people for freedom, democracy, and inclusiveness. So what you're saying is, uh once we fill our bellies, then we start to think about other issues. Yeah. But still, you presided over a government which achieved actually in the last 15 years an average growth rate of 1.5% or 9%, uh, which is an amazing growth rate. Uh, but you resigned. And my question is, wh wh yeah. why did you resign? I'm coming. I'm coming to that. <laughs> 
Do people really need to know? Why you resign? Yeah, I think, I think people also need to know the background. Otherwise, <laughs> okay. it doesn't okay. give any sense. You know, this is a country which has achieved uh, seven out of the eight Millennium Development Goals and given award by the United Nations. So all these good things can be spoken about this country. But there is one shortcoming. We haven't properly made uh, you know, our youth to be included into the system. And my government, I admittedly say that we do not properly understand the vision and quest of our young people. And, you know, we focused also on um, human resource development in order to address the skill gap. And, um, uh, you know, 18 years ago, we did have only two universities, but now we have 50 public universities, which is huge leap. And every year we have hundreds of thousands of graduates coming out of these universities. We have around 700 million technical and vocational colleges. That doesn't include the private sector. There are hundreds of uh, right. private sector universities and colleges. And added, we have more than half a million uh, graduates coming every year. And even though our economy has grown very fast, it has very less capacity to accommodate. But that's, that's all great. It's still why you leave. Yes. <laughs> um, so. Then I said, we have a problem of inclusiveness. Uh -huh. We have a problem of addressing, you know, multi-ethnic society. Uh, we have a problem of attitude. You know, uh, you know my party has been a, in a communist uh, mentality, but we are now a free market economy and a democratic multi-party democracy. There is a need for deep reform. Uh -huh. So I said, I have to set aside myself in order to force this deep reform. Otherwise, the reforms are going very slow and sluggish, which can ultimately yield to a disintegration of my country if we don't go fast in reforming in a genuine way and in a robust way. Otherwise, then the stake is that this country is going to be disintegrated. Do you, like guys, do you guys get this, what he's saying? This is really a very interesting point. Yeah. So How to force reform in a reluctant clique or yeah. ruling party by resigning and putting those guys on the spot. This is, yeah. uh, can we give a hand to the... Yeah. This, I, I think clearly... I never heard of this before. This is an amazing story actually. Is an African story need to be told. How a prime minister leave it all, put people against their responsibility to force reform. He could not force them to do it while in office. By the way, the main problem in African politics is because people stick to, stick, stick to power. And I wanted to show that it is, it is possible that you can leave uh, without having power while exercising the power as a private citizen in the country. So, uh, so th th there is no need to cling to power. Uh, I am professional. I can work. I can deliver to my people in a different capacity. But I have to also force the reform. Otherwise, my existence, my family's existence, and my friends and partners' existence depend on you know, widening democratic space in my country. Because if we say democracy is an existential issue for us, this sluggish process of reform doesn't yield. So we need to have expeditious reform to take place in my country. Wonderful. So I think Thank this you very is much. Uh, I think very that's, uh, that's, that's a very interesting issue. I think we all needed to know what is really happening in that very important African uh, country. These developments, which for some reason is not clear to us what has been going on there. Now we understand that the unrest has come down. Sure. And we have now a president, uh, sorry, a prime minister, Anoromo. I understand this first time somebody from the deep south now come to become a prime minister which is a real change in, in, in the atmosphere in, 
No, this is, this is interesting. Unfortunately, you have only 30 minutes. It's my foundation and has my name, but they always cut my time, unfortunately. So we have to, you know, we are Democrats. Uh, <laughs> so I'm gonna jump also to other issues which are th we are think also as uh, uh, equally important. Eritrea, we are puzzled. I mean, you guys are neighbors and cousins, shared blood, shared history, etc. And uh, you cannot just make peace together. I mean, why, why, why is this silly, you know, skirmishes? And, and what is this area in the border, which is, is nothing, is an arid area? What you guys are fighting over? It's, I, I think, um, yes, uh, Ethiopia and Eritrea are um, one people in two countries. So uh, I agree with you uh, fully that uh, we are the same people, but uh, the attitude differs. The thing is, you know, uh, if there is personality and feud, uh, I mean, the, the cult formation and, and feud, then I think uh, people do not see the greater uh, you know, uh, suffering that the people are, uh, uh, you know, exposed to, and they just focus on their personal stubborn character. That's the main problem. Yeah. Otherwise, the people are very eager to see the two countries make peace quickly and uh, so that they come together. Is, is Ethiopia willing to offer an olive branch to the Eritrean? I think that has already been done. You know, if, if, you, if you remember right, Immediately when I came to the helm of this power, I said, I am ready to go to Asmara and to discuss with the president of the country yeah. uh, so that we settle this issue. We said the, the border problems in Africa, 80% of the border problems in Africa has not yielded into conflict because Africans in the different parts of the border are the same people and it's a soft border. We don't need to have a pretext of saying that border problem is a problem that separates the two people. So I think we say this is a very small problem. The problem underlying behind is the aggressive nature of uh, leadership. Otherwise, um, uh, we say we have to sit down and discuss. So you, we, offered, you offered to go to Asmara? Yeah. Did not give you a visa or what? I, di I didn't get the visa. I didn't get the reply. I, I am very... Uh, optimist that my successor, the new prime minister, has also offered this immediately when he came to the premier position, and I hope there will be some response coming from there. I don't know if you have any Eritrean officials here today or not, but somebody should need to ask the Eritreans, why are you refused to talk? What is your problem? Is, is there any Eritrean official here? There are many. Okay. You want to say why you don't want to talk, guys? <laughs> Can I give him a mic, please? Okay. Uh, thank you very much in the first place. Uh, I'm not an official. I'm a former official. <laughs> With all due respect to what the Prime Minister said, I've been deeply engaged in this process because I was the commissioner for the UN mission in Eritrea and Ethiopia. I know the whole story. I follow the whole story. In fact, I have written a book about it. The issue is the agreement was for a final and binding decision by the Ethiopia-Eritrea Boundary Commission. The process is a very long one. Both countries were supposed to immediately implement unconditionally, unequivocally. So the boundary issue is resolved. The Boundary Commission could not demarcate because of obstructions that the Ethiopian government put by putting conditionalities. So the way forward to me, for me is, first of all, Ethiopia must unconditionally accept and implement the delimitation and demarcation decisions of the Boundary Commission. Withdraw its forces from territories awarded to Eritrea 
because the decision of the Boundary Commission was final and bounding to be implemented, binding, to be implemented unconditionally by both sides. Mm. So, so the one, way one forward second, for okay, me is... One second, just to... Uh, just one second. Let's is there an one, issue with accepting... One minute. Yeah. One I, minute. I will finish I think, one minute. I think we personally also yeah. discussed... Just to kill uh, the issues. You yes. Yes. One the ambassador, you know. The way I, forward. I, I personally discussed with the ambassador yes. time and again yes. on this issue. I think uh, it will be confusing for this uh, August uh, gathering if we go to the details of all those things, because I can also present my own, my own version of uh, what, what's going on. So the thing is, I admittedly say that the Ethiopian government has unconditionally accepted the boundary decision because we have signed to implement the boundary decision unconditionally. That has said time and again. So they accept it unconditionally. Why yeah. is it they don't accept? No, the problem is, okay, uh, one minute. Okay. The boundary issue is resolved. It should be implemented as is. The two countries can make any change they, they agree on, but it's a resolved issue, a done deal. There are outstanding issues between the two countries which must be discussed right, and resolved. But, but yes, my, my, but my point here, in order to resolve them, you guys need to talk, right? Yeah. So to talk they are going to issues. talk. Why are you talking? My good friend, the two countries went to war because they could not resolve it peacefully. They could not discuss. They wanted a court without a recourse to appeal. Now one has reneged, one hasn't. So the issue now is for Ethiopia to accept the, found the, the limitation and demarcation decisions of the Boundary Commission which it had accepted and signed as final and binding. We have accepted now, it and they withdraw a written a letter Ethiopia to the withdraws United its Nations. Forces okay. from Eritrean territory, simultaneously, discussions can begin to address all outstanding issues between the two countries. Yeah, but the point, my friend, here is that if they say we accepted the, the resolutions, now we need to sit down and talk. Yeah. You guys need to sit together and talk. Why refuse to talk? You need to talk, come and talk here in, in the Moibri Foundation. You, you guys go and sit together in the office and talk. Yeah. That's, okay. another, <laughs> that's another issue. Okay. I think the right approach for me, I don't make the government decision, but the right approach for me is, yes, let's talk. Okay. Let's bring our agenda items. Yeah. The boundary issue is resolved. Right. Out I know. I know. I know you are not Out talking. Yeah, I know you are okay. not talking to Mr. But let's talk all. about other issues. Yeah. By, by the way, we have offered this to talk with a mediator, without a mediator, or with third party. We can even start talking at the uh, you know experts level and then go further to the political level. We offer all things. The thing is, we haven't got a listening ear. It has fallen into a deaf ear. Okay, we started some discussion here now. We hope the message goes to the uh, government in, in, in Eritrea. And please, why are you two willing to talk? Just sit, there's no harm in talking. Just talk. Thank you very much, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Right, uh, Prime Minister, uh, I know the time is ticking. Another issue here, why the Egyptians are up in arms <laughs> about, about, about the dam? I mean, we understand you have an important development project. Egypt has a similar project when they have the high dam. And uh, uh, so it's legitimate for people to develop their countries, electrify it, etc. For me as an engineer, I'm also an engineer like you, the whole issue is the rate at which you're gonna fill yeah. the lake. And this is something so simple. You can have a simple mathematical formula relates with the rate of the rain and the, uh, the requirements, and you can just agree how you're gonna fill the dam. And, and you guys are good friends, and you can sell electricity to them, they can buy. So what is the big deal? Why all these, you know, fireworks? <laughs> Um, actually, there cannot be any resolution by fireworks. And uh, uh, 
this is an issue of uh, development and friendship. We believe that it will be a monument for uh, uh, cementing our uh, long-standing relations between Egypt, Sudan, and Ethiopia. I think the issue is many people do not ad understand that Ethiopia contributes 86% of the Nile River and was told that Ethiopia is not you know, allowed to use a single bottle of the Nile water. This is a long-standing mentality which has been uh, developed by our colonial masters. Again, the issue started during the colonial era. And, you know, the Egyptian children were, you know, uh, told that Nile is theirs. No one else, you know, has a share on the Nile River. So it has become, as you said, as simple as it is. It is the solution of the, uh, you know, the Renaissance Dam, which is supposed to produce 6,400 megawatts with the biggest in Africa, and also the A's globally. It's a big dam uh, built by the Ethiopian people because, you know, the international politics doesn't suit uh, because of the, this uh, 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 politics of the Nile, which is going on for many, many years. Now, uh, Ethiopia has not been building this dam simply because we were poor. Uh, but now we are able to raise money to build this dam. Uh, no, we started building this dam, but we are cognizant of the fact that the downstream countries uh, shouldn't be harmed as per the international law. There should not be any significant harm on Sudan as well as on Egypt. So we established an international panel of experts to look into the impact of the dam on downstream countries. And the international panel of experts, which, is, which has been chosen from the three countries together, has studied and recommended that this dam has to be modeled, but it is perfect, both engineering-wise as well as, uh, you know, uh, the operation-wise. So the whole thing is, this is a, now boils down to scientific and technical issue. So as you mentioned, you know, we both are engineers, we understand. I, I am hydraulic engineer and I understand even better. <laughs> so... It's true, I, I'm not... <laughs> I'm an electrical uh, engineer, yeah. <laughs> so the whole thing is, I, I, as luckily I became prime minister of this beautiful country, so I, I sat down with... Uh, during uh, President Mursi period with him and explained to him that don't politicize and legalize this issue because it is simply a scientific and technical issue. If you go politicizing and legalizing the issue and if you come and say that the colonial treaty which has been signed between Britain and Sudan and Egypt, Ethiopia has not been party because we were never being colonized. So we cannot accept this colonial treaty if you legalize the issue. Let's talk about the current issue, which is how to handle this issue without harming Egyptian farmers downstream and Sudanese farmers, and as well as Egyptian water users uh, all along the Nile course. So the whole thing boils down to how to fill the dam and how to operate the dam you know, optimally so that the farmers and all water users will not be affected. So we said, let us establish a technical uh, organ which works on this issue from three countries. So we agreed and we signed a declaration of principles and that was a basis for the technicians to work on. But yet after that, uh, Morsi had a meeting. It was live on television and I saw it. And uh, where they said, okay, we can go and bomb the dam we can arm the uh, terrorist groups in, 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 in the country. So how do you explain? You had this discussion, and then still they had this public meeting in which the leadership of the country is talking about attacking Ethiopia and, and destroying the dam, etc. How, what, what is, what's going on here? By the way, Mo, this is not a policy of uh, Mursi only. 
This is a policy long standing, including Mubarak has played this game, uh, never succeeded. So we said we, we are not nervous about it because this is a long standing policy, has never worked, and it, it will not work in the future as well. Now we are in 21st century. We have to sit down and resolve our problems through dialogue and discussions. And there is no need for war, whatever. So it's a shared uh, property, a shared resource. And Egyptians, Ethiopians, and the Sudanese, it's enough for all of us if we sit down and discuss and operate and work together. Even we can share this clean energy uh, between our, our two countries and also amongst the, the three of us. So this I is a very helpful statement. Yeah. And we don't understand then why aren't we able, I don't know if there's any Egyptian, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, government official here or, but again, people need, need to talk. I mean, these are issues which in my view is so, say, so easy, straightforward to resolve. I mean, why, why people are making all this fuss? We Africans are too dramatic, I think. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, now I, I, I want to open uh, the, the once, before I open the discussion, my country, what part of my country, I still call it my country, South Sudan, what is going on there? I mean, this, this is incredible. The number of people killed in South Sudan is incredible. The resources wasted on buying arms, what we see are warlords killing each I don't see anybody credible over there. You guys and the international community still insist on talking to Salva Kerr, talking to uh, you know, Mashar. Or to, in my view, all those guys are, are war criminals. Why are you talking to war criminals? Yeah, uh, Mo, I think um, I cannot judge immediately because uh, it's not a court. So <laughs> I. I will say this, immediately after my resignation, I asked them, please, would you resign? Because you failed to resolve this problem in South Sudan. You told please. that to Selva Kerr? Yeah, I told to all. And uh, in my view, I think it is a leadership failure and it should be resolved accordingly. Otherwise, it cannot have a sustainable solution in South Sudan. I think the people are demanding, uh, demanding, uh, you know, seriously, that this thing has to be resolved uh, very quickly because this country has suffered for uh, half a century now, and still people are continuing to flow to Ethiopia, Uganda, Sudan as refugees. We have more refugees now than we had before yeah. during the war. They came back to the refugee camps they left 20 years ago. So I think this is a very uh, heartbreaking situation in uh, South Sudan. And we tried our best as, as a chair of IGAD, we tried our best uh, to resolve this issue. Agreements are signed but never implemented and I don't see that further more agreements can be signed but I don't think it will be implemented as the, the, the history shows. And so the, the only uh, thing now remains is that leaders should come to their senses, to their mind, and, and they should sub, somehow uh, leave so that they can uh, give to the new leadership, new blood leadership, who can take the country to the next level. Well, unfortunately, Fistas Mukhai, our board member and our laureate, uh, is uh, unfortunately in hospital. He couldn't join us. Uh, we wish him speedy recovery. And he is working, running around in South Sudan on behalf of the African Union. And I kept, kept saying, Festas, you know, it's not working. Why are you guys wasting your time? So, you know, you, you just find a way to, to, but the problem is nobody, I mean, the country may be needed to take it to trusteeship. Is that a solution? I don't know, but. Um yeah, but I mean, really, this is a failed state as they come. But let's agree that it should be resolved and everybody has to uh, help, including, including our uh, union, the African Union and the uh, United Nations has to uh, take aggressive actions uh, so that the thing has to come to normalcy. Thank you. Uh, we have only time for one, maybe, or two questions. 
but really we need a good question. And question, not statement. Uh, I cannot see people from here, but uh, can, can somebody manage this process? Who is raising their hands here? Okay. Thank you. My name is Martha Wangari. I'm a member of parliament from Kenya. My question, I'm a believer of change from inside. Um, I have not got your reasons for resignation, but I wonder, whatever you wanted to achieve, forcing reforms, is it working? Is it measurable? Yeah, I think uh, uh, before my resignation, we have put in place um, six agenda items for reform. The first one is reforming democratic institutions. Uh, that includes, you know, uh, you know, our national electoral uh, commission and other democratic institutions. And uh, this also includes engaging with political parties, deep and genuine engagement with political parties of the country, and see any changes in, in the regulatory and legal systems that can help uh, proceed with, you know, widening democratic space in Ethiopia. Uh, so that Ethiopians now are demanding uh, uh, a, a widened democratic space in the country and that has to be addressed properly. So I think this is one of the pillar uh, agenda items in our reform. Uh, even though you understand that uh, the, the, uh, Ethiopia, uh, you know, compared with many, uh, many countries, uh, level of corruption in Ethiopia is not as high as uh, in, in other countries. But even then, we said there should be zero tolerance for corruption. And therefore, uh, we have to reform uh, to bring about you know, a political economy that helps uh, move forward and brings about um, a robust private sector engagement in our economic uh, sphere. So transforming uh, this issue is very, very essential. So we are in the, you know, Ethiopia has come, the economy has hit, and uh, there are imbalances uh, within our economy and needs a structural transformation quickly. And that reform has to take place. And that is uh, the, the second issue, which is a very important issue, apart from uh, the democratic uh, uh, space and uh, building democratic uh, institutions and also building democratic culture uh, in the country. Um, we, you know, sometimes people talk about democracy only as election. I think democracy is much more deeper than election. And democracy is making people part and parcel in all the engagements, including economic development and social transformation. So people think that, you know, some election, I know many African elections are done simply either by ethnic mobilized or paid. Then afterwards, somebody wins and we, we clap our hands and then we say that, you know, democracy prevails in those countries. I think we have to stop those things. Democracy is beyond election. Um, so putting our people empty bail and talking about democracy is something which is not sustainable. So to us, we need to uh, reform all, do, all those things, not by saying, but by showing in practice and in, in real terms. So Ethiopian reform needs deep reform that uh, takes the country up. To me, the achievements we have made so far in terms of economic progress in the country is remarkable. No one can deny this. Uh, but we have to use this opportunity to have that basis to transform the country. You know, in any uh, settings, for example, I can, I can cite many examples which has transited into the, you know, democracy after a, a number of years of fast economic growth which has created, you know, a vibrant society. Uh, like the Taiwanese, the Koreans, uh, as an example. That needs 
an accelerated, fast, and sustained growth. Without that, Africa cannot come out of object poverty we are in. So I think a growth rate below 7% is not sustainable. And every African country has to think about this. You know, countries with three, four percentage annual growth rate cannot bring about rapid economic change in their own countries. Africa needs to have a fast economic growth. And I think we have to see it in a comprehensive manner, how to transform uh, our societies. If we don't address the infrastructure deficit, then we will not change the political economy. We cannot have a competitive private sector. And it, will, it, it, it leads and ends up into corrupt practices with the leaders assigned. So infrastructure deficit has to be addressed in Africa in a very robust and fast manner. And similarly, the gap of human resource development and skill gap, which hinders the private sector to be very competitive. And otherwise, we can't. So these things call upon we in the African continent to, to have a robust economic growth. Ethiopia has done that, but we have also our own shortcomings. That's why we need a deep reform to change the whole, the whole thing. And with subsistence economy, you cannot have democracy. Because there has been a long period of Africa where there is subsistence economy, people do not demand. You have to bring about you know, a robust economic change that helps people to demand. You know, demanding society has to be created in order to have a solid base for democratization. Otherwise, uh, it doesn't work. So I think the Ethiopian story, sometimes people misunderstand simply by saying, you know, election and all those, you know, superstructure things without looking into the basis of how the reform and transformation taking place in this country. So I think, um, that's why I said thank you for giving me this opportunity to, ex to explain the story, the real story of my country, and which I believe if we can succeed in our democratization and economic transformation, then this country will be, uh, you know, uh, sustainable, will be peaceful and stable. Well, Minister Haile Mariam, that was a really fantastic conversation. And uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, very important thoughts we heard here about the map for African development and the experience, particular experience of Ethiopia and the way forward. And I just wish to express my great respect, really, for a very important uh, African leader. Please share me to thank him for his participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.